very much. I'm going to begin by breaking down this title. <laughs> the effects of expressive arts on decision making. Do you know what expressive arts is? Expressive arts is the emerging field that centers its attention on the internal and behavioral changes that happen to individuals and groups as a result of engaging in art artistic activities. Decision making is the activity of choosing one action over another. So the first line proposes that engaging in artistic activities could have an effect on choosing one activity or one thing over another. The second line is sense making in situations of complexity and ambiguity. Sense making is actually a field in organizational development uh, that started maybe the, in the last 10 years and is um, the stage be before decision making when a person or an organization are orienting themselves within a situation. Sense making answers two questions what's going on here? and to what do I do next? So if what is happening here uh, right now, you are orienting yourself within this um, presentation and you're, you're finding out what it is before you can make a decision. I like it, it's not for me. Something like that. Um, in situations of complexity, can, can I have the next slide please? <laughs> Okay, so complexity is a very specific thing nowadays because uh, around the world it has become uh, very interesting for in science and in every field. And uh, organizational development takes its cues from scientific development. And they use uh, those me as metaphors to think about how to organize their organizations with people. So a system exhibits complexity when it has diversity, interconnectedness, interdependence, and is capable of learning, which is adaptation. So we can think of EGS as a complex adaptive system, but we can think about each one of us as a complex adaptive system. Because as humans, we come in and out of different identities that we easily put on and take off. I'm a student here, I'm a mother at home, I'm a coach with my clients, and I don't have any problem going from one to the other. And of course, if I, do, if I become a mother here, that doesn't work. <laughs> so all of us do this. So these different things, these identities, are what gives diversity to a human being as a complex adaptive system. They are interconnected, they are interdependent. What I learn here as a student affects how I perform as a mother, as a coach, as a wife, as a whatever else I do. And learning adaptation, that means that when one of the things in the system it stops working or it changes, the other ones can fill in or take over that function. That makes it different than a system that is not a complex adaptive system. For example, a car, if it breaks down one part of it, the other parts cannot come in and take over that function or a, or a watch. But a person, let's say I have been a student here, I definitely will, my learning ability will be in other areas as well and I have in the dissertation when you read it, um, you'll find examples of people who did that, who went from a job that was creative to less creative, so then they took an art class <laughs> to you know, balance themselves out. Can I have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Oh, no, I'll go back. Go back. I think you were missing you. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> they look so similar. Okay. <laughs> ambiguity. Ambiguity is also a very precise term. It's different than uncertainty. Ambiguity is a situation <coughs> in which we have many, many, many different options that are plausible, maybe equally attractive. Uncertainty is the opposite, is when we don't know what our options are. 
So questions that have to do with ambiguity, I found, are the questions where expressive arts come in with force, with force as an uh, effective tool. And a question that has to do with ambiguity, for example, is what's my place in the community? Well, that depends on who I am. So questions that have to do with ambiguity are based in identity construction. And therefore, you have to use sense making for that. What's going on here and what will I do next? Who am I in this situation and what do I want to do next? Um, next slide, please. So that's me circa 1991, <laughs> when I was an engineering student. I studied industrial engineering, which is a specialization in how to make systems work. But that type of system was about production systems of anything. And Looking back, I realized that the systems I wanted to work were the systems in my own life. <laughs> <laughs> but this, that's only in retrospect that I figured that out. Uh, while I was a student, next slide please, I was also painting a lot. I was a good student and a happy partying person. <laughs> but my paintings were always very dark. Uh -huh. And I didn't know anything about this. I didn't realize that. Uh, some people commented on it, and I was puzzled too. Probably oh, that's weird. <laughs> and I realized now again in retrospect, and especially after having done this dissertation, that I was using it as emotional management. Mm -hmm. So all the things I didn't want to express in my life, I was expressing in my paintings. And for that reason, when I tried to take art classes at the university, I had to drop out every time because they would try to make me do something. <laughs> and that truth is, it's like, what? Sculpt and go bottom. I can't do that, so I get out. <laughs> so it was not about the object that I was, was going to make. My only interest was about the change that was, that was happening within myself because of these things that were coming out, this thing. Next slide, please. Oh, well, this is <laughs> the reason why I chose engineering, because I wanted to envision and create a life that I would enjoy in every aspect. And in my country, in Venezuela, and in my family, you know, people, it, there wasn't that concept of being an artist. If you're being an artist, how are you going to make money? <laughs> So, of course, you know, the engineers, they envision and create stuff too. So that's why it made sense to me. That's my father is an engineer. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you can see, <coughs> art is keeping me balanced. I'm from the Andes Mountains, that's why it's like that. This is circa 1991 as well. So it's not suspect. No, but the Andes Mountains are the same. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about the research. It's divided in three parts. In the first part, since I came in with this idea that art was doing something for me, and I was able to describe my art as some kind of adaptive system, as survival, as my salvation. I was very uh, passionate and dramatic about it. And I knew other people who felt the same way, and we describe it that way. On the other hand, we all know the story of the torture artist who ended all in suicide, right? So how come if the salvation and uh, survival, why is that happening? So I wanted to look at how does this thing work when it's working right, when it's helping me live and thrive? So I found a group of people, um, eight men and eight women, ages ranging from 30 to 73, from different countries, that I have known all of them for at least one year, that were well respected in the community, 
that had practiced art from childhood to the moment of injury, and I suspect they continue after that. Um, <laughs> and uh, that had different professions. They were a very diverse group in keeping with the idea of a complex adaptive system that has diversity, that mirrors what's happening to humanity. And I asked them these two questions. I interviewed them each for one hour and recorded. So how have the arts accompanied you from childhood to today? And what role did the arts play when you made decisions? After I um, recorded those interviews, I typed everything out myself, and then I analyzed. I'm trying to not confuse you with the steps, so I don't need to look. Yes, so then I analyzed the data, and I went through the whole text asking, what is art doing here? What is art doing here? What is art doing here? What's the function of art here? And I was making not, oh, art is doing this, 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 the different, you know, the, all those hours of interviews. Then I cut that out. And I was thinking, well, functions take place in an area, in a domain, right? Mm -hmm. So I started to arrange this. What area do they fit in? And I came up with um, five domains that I will talk about in the, in the, in the next. The second part of the research, I took that in, those insights from the first part. I combined it with our methodology and our theory in expressive arts, as well as with my research from organizational development, specifically sense making. And I made a workshop that I offered to, be, to a group and also to a simplified version I offer to individual people. And the workshop was designed to help them uh, with questions of ambiguity. They brought questions that were ambiguous. So I they had them write the question at first, and then I analyzed what was the result of taking this workshop afterwards. The third part of the research was to gather the information from the participants to see if expressive arts had been helpful to make decisions, and if so, in what way. So, what I wanted is to see if this adaptive way of using the art that some people have can be taught to other people who may, may or may not be artists. That doesn't matter. That's what I wanted to find out. And then we could integrate it into expressive arts so that we can use it as well as practitioners. Next slide, please. This is just uh, the, some of the characteristics of the people that I interview, half men, half of them were men, half of them were women, different. Um, some married, some divorced, some engaged, some separated. <laughs> I took some other um, details just to because I found it was interesting. Some were Buddhist, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, spiritual. The practices they use, most of them had more than one art practice. One of them had music, painting, reading, poetry, and drawing. Another one had painting. Another music and painting. Another one writing. Another one painting, cartooning. Another one was a musician and a DJ. <laughs> Another dancing, poetry, sculpting, and drawing. Another one, woodworking and making models. Next slide, please. And these are the domains of influence that I found. The self domain, the emotional management domain, the connection to people domain, the connection to the world domain, and the creative visualization domain. So art making played an important part in each one of these domains for those well-adapted people. Uh, the self domain uh, was basically about the self. It has nothing to do with advancing relationships with others, which I found interesting and beautiful that us, many of us, 
uh, and these well adapted people, <laughs> make things um, only for ourselves to express, um, to use skills that we have used in the past, that we have, that we have from the past, to express our drive to create something, etc. I'm not going to go into each one of these because of the time limit, but it's very interesting and it's all detailed in the dissertation. Emotional management domain, it was used um, to add fun into my life for people and to release unwanted emotions. So I had someone who told me the only reason why I survived high school was because I had my art class. So that having that fun added into her life buffer the negative things that she experienced during that time. Connection to people domain. This was used in many ways, you can read about it. But I'll tell you two. To identify like-minded individuals and immediately belong to groups of artists. One person identified her husband through it because he took her to a private garden where nobody could go in and recited her a poem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a decision. <laughs> <laughs> I made that decision then. <laughs> um, also connection to family. It was surprising to me because I thought connection to people would be about my friends and the people who live around me, but actually it also is people told me about their grandfather who taught their mother to do this, and she taught me and now I'm teaching my children. So this is another way how the arts help in connection with people. Connection to the world domain is about how materials work. When people know how materials work, they can extrapolate to how any material works what goes into any work, what type of skill, time spent on that. And so that gives you a, a, a grip the, on how the, the, world, the, the tangible work works. Creative visualization was about the ability to see things. If you um, have an uh, intimate knowledge of how materials work, then you can imagine how you could make, for example, the shape of a building. Maybe if you didn't, then you would say, well, how do you put that on that incline? I'm not sure that's going to happen. So it expands your ability to imagine things because you have an intimate knowledge of how materials work. Next slide, please. So at first, once I found the domains, they were all separated. And I thought, well, I'm going to try to arrange them somehow. So this was the first um, arrangement. I put the cell domain in the middle, emotional management right outside of that, connection to people right outside of that, connection to the world after, and um, creative visualization. Like an onion or a very typical representation of something like this. But this didn't really work because the self can be affected by creative visualization without going through the other ones. Next slide, please. So, this is a better representation of that. It's a network keeping in the thinking of complexity science and complex adaptive system. Each one of those domains affect each other and they are all affected by the environment. Of course, being humans, we're not just affected by the environment. We are active in changing the environment. We simultaneously try to make the environment see us in a certain way and are affected by how the environment sees us. So this is a two-way two street, all of this. Uh, next slide, please. I already talked about this, and the, the presentation was going to be kind of long if I go into everything again. So I um, decided to go to the next slide. We're going to go over these slides. You already know this, I already told you the general idea. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so you understand the general idea of what happened in the first part. <coughs> now, in the second part of the research, I offered the workshops to help people with their decision making in, uh, in situations of ambiguity. Next slide, please. Well, I took my group to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and there were many things going on before my workshop to prime the land. <laughs> uh, expressive arts things and other things. And we were all inspired by looking at this. Mountains. Next slide, please. So the group um, that participated in the workshop type of things uh, were six people. And the type of questions that they addressed were this. What is my role in the community? How can I fit more in my plate without taking anything off? <laughs> How am I going to conduct my life as a single person and stay balanced? How can I move forward in my art career? What should I do next professionally? And what should I look for in a future mate? <laughs> So you see, all these questions are based on identity construction. Yeah. Next slide, please. Okay. So I'm going to give you a tiny bit of the theory of sense making. You, you already know that sense making answers basically two questions. What is going on here and what am I going to do next? What is going, here, what going on here and, or, and what are we going to do next? if we're talking about an organization or any group. So in the theory, um, Carl Wake, that I really highly recommend that you read his books. It's so fun and beautiful how he writes. Okay. <laughs> in the theory, um, he has identified the seven characteristics of sense making. It's grounded in identity construction, we know what that is. It's retrospective, that means what, what did I do in the past about questions of this type. It's an active of sensible environment, it means that it, it, it allows you to make sense of something so that you can enact or take positive action. It's social, very important, because even if we're not discussing it with everyone, with anyone, we are still thinking about that we are living in a society that we, that things are gonna, people are gonna be affected by our choices. So sense making is always social. It's ongoing, of course, like um, life is a flow, so it's always happening. We are always trying to figure out what's happening. It's focused on and by extracted cues. This is very important because there are many, many things happening and we, don't, we choose a little bit of here, here, and here and make sense with that, of what happened. We cannot see everything. And many people looking at exactly the same situation choose different cues and come up with a different, uh, a different idea of what actually happened. So it's driven by possibility rather than accuracy. That means that instead of, it's impossible to, to measure accuracy when we are making sense and acting in life because what we think is immediately changing what we're doing and how we are acting in life. Therefore, we can only talk about what's plausible, what's possible. If it's accurate, predictions are already changing what will happen. If I make a prediction, I already am affecting the future, therefore accuracy is not, we can use that <laughs> in this type of question. Next slide, please. And I want to tell you exactly what I did in the workshop, in case somebody wants to repeat it. 
and I'm going to go step by step. So, next slide, please. The first step, what I did was to draw this picture. I don't know if you can see it very well. Mm -hmm. Too much yeah. light. No, it's fine. It's good from here. It's fine. Yeah. I was inspired, of course, by New Mexico. And this picture was to bring home the idea of decision making in situations of ambiguity as a process and not an event. So is, this, this, is this your drawing? This is my drawing. Yes. So this thing that you, eat, that you see here, the ball in the middle, is the decision. Can you see that ball? Yes. Yeah. And the people around it is one person. When the person is really close to the decision, the person can see how this decision interacts with the landscape and with the environment. The person is blocking some of the natural ways in which this decision would go. Each time the person takes a step back, the person can see more the interaction of this, this question with the environment and see where it would go. Maybe the person doesn't even have to make a decision because it will roll naturally somewhere. So I wanted to illustrate that for, for the group. Next slide, please. The next step, I had the people choose a different color paper from, I had put different colors papers on the floor, and I said, think of the question that you brought and how do you feel about it? And choose a paper that goes with that emotion. So once they had the paper, I asked them to write three things on that paper. The question, the area of life where that question belongs, and what process will I use to answer this question? Meaning, not, not the actual process, but for example, I'll give you an example. The question, what is my place in the community? What area of life does this belong in? Um, creative work or um, contribution. What process? Then the third one would be, what process will I use to decide what is my place in the community? Next slide, please. Then I had all the people, once they wrote this, that was a, a hard process because there was a lot of emotion uh, about the question. People mm -hmm. were emotional about their question, mm -hmm. difficult questions. And they were writing, they were so, you know, into it and so serious, you're very focused. So then I got them to stand in a circle. And then I said, okay, now take your paper and turn it, make it into a ball. And everybody started to laugh. And then, so I, said, I put drum music and said, okay, now I want you to throw this question around and play with it. <laughs> so they were throwing and they were using uh, drums and things to play bass with their question. And they were screaming, is this my question? This is not my problem. <laughs> they were getting confused with it. Um, next slide, please. This was the room where that was taking place up there. Then I, t I told them, well, now we're going to take this question on the, the landscape. We're going to see how this question behaves on the landscape. So we went outside into the garden. In the garden, there were a lot of hammocks and chairs and dry fountains. I said, well, see how your question behaves on the landscape. What does it like? <laughs> and people were, you know, making animal noises. They were hurling their questions out <laughs> <laughs> with the drum thing. And they were throwing it up. Questions were being, getting stuck on the tree. <laughs> um, it's out of my hands. <laughs> uh, they were screaming funny things. They were really playful, like, it likes the smell of roses. You know? <laughs> so then I had them come back in. Next uh, slide, please. And these are some of, and then I asked them, well, now that you saw how your question behaves in the landscape, I want you to make a work of art about your question. Um, and I suggested, what about how this question has lived in your life before? But I always say in my workshops, everything I say is a suggestion. Mm -hmm. And 
if you want to do something else, do it. No questions would be asked about why you didn't follow the suggestion. I don't care. So, these are some of the examples of the art that we made. And next slide, please. After they made their art, I had them individually write about the art and about the process. I gave them 10 minutes for each thing. And the total time for the art making was around 30 minutes. It was pretty quick. And next slide, please. So then we sat in a circle, and everybody told about their art, told about their process, and other people asked questions or gave feedback about the art and about the process. And that's how we did the harvesting and integration, and people thought about what step should I take next? What's the next step after this? After this insight I got from this work. Next slide, please. Okay, the third part of the research was to gather the data from that whole process. And I had been recording the whole thing. <laughs> so all I did was to type everything out and analyze what exactly happened. And this is, I want to take you uh, more intimately into the process now. Next slide, please. We're going to look at this particular work, one of the participants. So you see here is the roll-up paper, that brown paper there, and like a net. And then there is a piece of card, and over there a blue water thing. So she wrote, what is my role in the community? For her, this was meaningful work. And how do I make a decision about what is my role in the community? Next slide, please. I'm going to read you some of this. This is an excerpt from her actual process. I was bored with my question when we started. It was a question I have been moving with for a really long time, and I was bored. I love that we got to scrunch up the question we wrote. It was like suddenly I went from being bored into complete release. I could throw it around. It's not boring. I don't have to take it seriously. I love that. It really, really worked. During the playtime, there were points where other people would say, is this my position? Looking at the scrunch up paper <laughs> in your hands. I really like that. I thought, that happened to me in my life. I'm asked to make decisions about all kinds of things. And I'm like, that's not my decision. That's not my problem. That really told me something. Then we went into the art, and I didn't have an image. I didn't make any decisions beyond what I was doing in each instance. First, I decided I want that material. And then I decided I want that piece of square card. And then I decided it's like there was no sense of going anywhere. It was each, it was each step without sense. That was very good. I like that. What I wrote was, my decision sits on a throne, the throne of my history. It's ugly, but it's safe and it's held. A path of earth, of earth leads away. In the distance, a pool of cool water. Decision, decision. You look settled in as if you don't want to move yet. How have you come to be where you are? I made decisions because they felt right. I made decisions about work because opportunities arose. It's like every decision was falling into two sections. Things that, I, that just happened and things that I went out looking for. So it seems that it's things that I invested in that will bring me happiness. I must follow what my heart tells me. The decision to let go of an activity I chose, I choose and I can trust because I know when, I, when it feels right and when it doesn't. Meaningful work is not just what you get paid for. And about her process, she wrote, I got lost, lots out of this process. It's amazing to have gone from having been bored with that question to where I am now. I have let go of it, and at the same time, I'm, I also feel much more engaged with it. I can feel that I don't need to know where I'm going, but I do need to invest in what I like on this road. I have to balance these two things together. 
Next slide, please. So the domain analysis, we, well, the, the main one was the emotional shift of going from bored and tired with this question to re-engage with this question. I think that's the, the main force that will help some, someone move forward. Let's go to the next slide. The sense-making analysis, you remember that sense-making answers two questions. What's going on here? What am I going to do next? So what, was going on, what, what is going on here in her case? Reluctance to engage with an ambiguous issue. A shift in mood triggered by making the paper into a ball. Obtaining an insight that many decisions are not in her hands, but in the influence of others and the environment. Having no sense of going anywhere, if you remember she said that when she was making the art. A sensation common whenever we are engaged in a multi-level process where meanings are not kept in mind at all times. I think we have all experienced that making art or in any long, writing a dissertation, hello. <laughs> in any long process there are going to be times when, when we feel that. Um, trying new things because they were readily available and occasionally she had specific desires that she went after. So that's what she realized was happening here. What should I do next? Well, she did identify two key processes to make her decision. Follow that which she desires and letting go of what is not to her taste from the things she tries. The workshop facilitated a positive outlook associated with the search required to answer the question, what is my role in the community? Which a driving force to continue that search. A greater tolerance of uncertainty and ambiguity. She said, I don't need to know. I just need to do these two processes. And a clear strategy. I need to invest in what I like and release what I don't like. So I think she got a lot. Next slide. So that's all I'm going to say about the, the workshop. And now I, I am starting the closing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, may, I put this diagram in there because when we are using language and logic, we are on a road somewhere. And it's an extremely effective tool to be on this road somewhere. Mm -hmm. But if we are on the ro wrong road, <laughs> that's very difficult. Very difficult. Language and logic are not going to take us out to the, the correct road. How do we do that? We have to engage in a process that doesn't put us in a road. A process in which each interaction with a material can signify a different road. I think everybody who has made something with their hands has experienced that as you make it, new decisions are, oh, I'm going to change this, I'm going to go this way. So that's what expressive art is. It's like a, a play where you can reorient yourself so that once you get on the road, you're on the right road. Mm -hmm. Then you can use logic, math, and all these other things that are really fun to, to take you there on time. But, and you don't have to waste time on Rearrange yourself. Next slide, please. The closing. Okay, so I'm going to say about decision making. It was thought that decision making are intellectual exercises. In this research, we have observed that decisions are complex, social, emotional, and evolving processes. It was thought that people analyze and then decide. In this research, we have observed that strategic decisions unfold in, non, in a nonlinear manner, with solutions frequently arising from a shift in self-perspective. Three, it was thought that people decide and then act. In this research, we have observed that strategic decisions often evolve over time and proceed through a repeating process of action and interpretation. This research suggests that we could avoid difficulties by assuming that decision-making is a process and not an event. 
When confronted with a difficult decision, we might benefit from asking, what process will I use to make this decision instead of what decision should I make? And five, as we observe in the findings from the coaching participant, expressive arts can provide an outstanding process to make decisions in situations of complexity and ambiguity. I think that's all, but next slide, please. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Videos about expressive arts and arts for healing. Join our newsletter at www.lfcreative.org.